On behalf of the National Eczema Association, I'd like to welcome you all to our webinar Wednesday presentation, all about complementary and alternative treatments for eczema. I'm your host, Danny Morsehead, and I am the Marketing and Communications Manager here at the National Eczema Association. And our presenter today is Peter Leo, MD. Dr. Leo is an Assistant Professor of Clinical Dermatology and Pediatric Dermatology at Northwestern University's Feinberg School of Medicine. He's also the founding director of the Chicago Integrative Eczema Center and a member of the NIA Scientific and Medical Advisory Council and NIA Board of Directors. And with that, I would like to welcome Dr. Peter Leo. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to be here and I'm going to put my presentation up right now. Does that, does that look okay? Looks great. Awesome. All right. So thank you, everybody, for joining us tonight. I uh, have a lot in store for you. I have a lot of slides, but I promise to make it fun and light, and we'll have plenty of time for questions. But this is a really interesting area to me. This is my passion, and it's thinking about that overlap between complementary and alternative treatments and eczema or atopic dermatitis. So this is, this is what I really spend most of my days thinking about in one way or another. These are my disclosures. We're not going to really talk about any specific products tonight, though. We're going to be talking about more like botanical treatments and general therapies like that. I really love this quote because this puts things in perspective, and this is how I feel pretty much every day of the week. There was a famous, um, famous naturalist physician. He's often considered the father of toxicology, um, but also from a derm perspective, he's the father of balneology using basically balneotherapy bath treatments, spa treatments to help people. And this is Paracelsus. And he said, quote, if disease put us to the test, all our splendor, title, ring, and name will be as much help as a horse's tail, unquote. I like that a lot. And that's often how I feel, that we have all these things we've done. We've studied all these things. We know all this stuff. And for a lot of the hard conditions that we treat, it doesn't matter. The patients still suffer. And you guys know that. So the biggest thing that I spend my time on is atopic dermatitis, and we have come a long way in understanding it, but there are still tons and tons of unanswered questions. But it's better than it was 10 years ago. It's way better than it was 50 years ago, and it's unbelievably better than it was a couple hundred years ago. And we've seen this changing over time. In fact, we just finished a textbook chapter on the history of eczema, some of the earliest references are actually in the Ebers papyrus from ancient Egypt. This disease has been with us for a very long time, but conceptions of what it is and why it happens have continued to change and develop. I would say what we're looking at here on this slide is the best and most modern understanding of the disease that I've ever seen. I love this. This is from just a couple of years ago, but I love it in part because of its organization. It is showing us this vicious circle, this terrible vicious cycle or circle that it goes into. And I think this is important because no matter where you begin in this cycle, you end up falling prey to being part of all of it. So let's start at the top. The in, this is called the inflammatory loop in atopic dermatitis. At top, we have the skin barrier. And we know the skin's so important, it keeps water in, keeps you know us in ourselves and keeps water in, but it also keeps allergens, irritants, pathogens, bacteria, viruses, all that kind of stuff out. So if the barrier starts getting weak or leaky, as I like to call it, then this allows for the microbiome to fall out of whack. It falls out of balance. And when that happens, Staph aureus bacteria, Staphylococcus aureus bacteria overgrows. When that happens, a lot of bad things go downstream from there. Most importantly, it releases a bunch of toxins on and in our skin that then drives both the immune system, but also damages the skin barrier. You can see the area goes both ways from the microbiota. When it drives the immune system, then we have another arrow because the immune system releases all these inflammatory factors, things like IL-4 and IL-13, these messengers between cells that basically call more inflammation, they make their own problem worse, but also damage the skin barrier. And then those mediators, the, the cell messengers that cause more inflammation, not only drive that, but they also make us feel itchy. And of course, when we feel itchy, we scratch. When we scratch, we further damage the skin barrier. So it is a crazy vicious cycle. And this is the heart of the disease. That's why when people say, what's the root cause? It's like 
Mm, it's kind of complicated, right? It's weird. It's like it's this whole circuit that's abnormal. And it could be any one of those things. You could start out with a bad microbiome. You could start out with uh, malfunction in the nerve endings. You could start out with the immune system overreacting to something. You could start out with leaky skin. Um, but no matter where you start, all of them are brought in. And let's say something triggered this. Let's say, for example, you got exposed to chemical, an irritant that drove the immune system crazy. So the immune system revved up appropriately. You got you know something on your skin that your body didn't like. Well that thing may have triggered it, but then it could disappear. Maybe you got exposed to it once. You were walking in a shopping mall and bam, that did it. Now it's gone, but now you're stuck in the cycle. So it's like, what's the root cause? Well, it was something, but that thing's gone. So even if you avoided that, now you're avoiding it. You haven't been exposed. I often liken it to a forest fire. When the forest fire is burning, even if you caught the little kid who was playing at matches, I mean, that kid's back back home in Ohio watching TV. He does, you know, He's not playing any role in the fire now. He was important. It doesn't mean we don't want to know it. It just means that it may not help us to remove that initial trigger after a certain point. We are learning more and more about the disease. And one of the fascinating things is that this is probably not one disease. That's really important too, because we often treat it like one size fits all, but it's really different. And so we're starting to get some very crude, very, uh, the beginnings of here, you know, this is sort of the infancy of understanding this, but being able to separate it among different people and groups and be able to say different ages, how it looks different, both in terms of the immune response, but also in terms of that skin barrier. And with hope, we are going to be able to get down to the individual level, right? That's the holy grail to be able to say, okay, the reason you have this is because of X, Y, and Z. And then hopefully we can fix it. We can say, all right, we're going to give you ABC to fix this. The other thing I've been interested in are these disease patterns. I like to call it the shape of your eczema. I'm fascinated by this. Some of my patients are like the, the graph on the lower left part of the screen. They're pretty good. And then maybe like once a year or twice a year, they have a big flare up and then they're okay. So maybe that's a seasonal thing in the heat of summer with sweat and irritation or the cold, dry part of winter, right? Other people are like the one above it, the upper left spiky, lots of flare ups. Other people are like the one in the in the middle, lower, where it's just pretty bad all the time, maybe slight ups and downs. There are two patterns that I think are worth really pointing out that are of concern, and one of, one of them is the goal. So the upper right-hand corner is what I call the escalating pattern. This is where it keeps getting worse, worse, worse. This, to me, is a very bad sign. I inherit a lot of patients like this. A lot of times it's topical or oral, st oral steroids that are making this this pattern happen i kind of feel like this is the kind of tsw initiation pattern the topical steroid withdrawal or in this case addiction like you're needing more and more and more that's a big red light when i see this pattern happening i'm like we got to do something different the one in the upper middle that's the one we want that i call a damping pattern right it goes do 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 down that's what we want for our patients and in fact that fits really well with the treatment goals of many of the guidelines this is from the asia pacific guidelines this is from 2013 but it's still just as relevant today that we can't i wish i could just turn it off and keep it off but usually it's a little bit more of a of a ramping down again i think it speaks to the cyclical nature of the disease we can kind of dun, 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 and we get it under good control and hold it there now the cool thing is that what i find for a lot of my patients is that once we get it under good control and we have it there for a while we break that vicious cycle so that when we let go meaning we like cut back on our treatments or ease up on our treatments, many of my patients are in a remission state, which is really, really cool. Not all, I wish it could be all, but many, and that's powerful stuff. And that's what I'm always trying to do, get it to that point where we've broken the vicious cycle. And I often say we're now in the virtuous cycle. Things are going well. The microbiome is strong. The skin barrier is strong. The nerve endings are calmed down. The immune system is relaxed. And there's one that wasn't on that chart, this part the mind-body connection. Because when you're stressed out and exhausted and not sleeping well, that of course makes everything worse. When you're feeling better and sleeping well and less stressed, that makes everything better, right? So all of those pieces are gonna play a role in this. And the approach to treating this condition from a conventional standpoint, right? What we, what we kind of do in the, the most conventional dermatology practices is based on this idea. This is from the European guidelines, but it's very, very nice where we really are trying first to be just gentle skincare. So we see, we do some education. We look at the bottom first. Everybody should get a little bit of education about what this is and what to expect. We should be using good moisturizers. Most people find not 100%, no doubt. I have some patients who hate moisturizers and find their skin does better without, but 
many patients find if they just use some moisturizers, they're much better. It's great. And gentle bathing and avoiding things that are known to irritate or trigger their skin. Easy peasy. For a lot of people in the world, probably no one on tonight, because if you're interested in this disease, you probably, either you or someone you care about, has it much more severe than this. But for the vast majority of the world, if you look at all all patients with atopic dermatitis, that's a, that's enough to help a lot of them, like lots of people. They're like, oh, I just use a little moisturizer. And I see those patients all the time not referred to me for atopic dermatitis. Usually they're referred to me for a skin check or a funny mole. And they say, doc, my, my legs are so dry and itchy. And I look and it's, it's atopic dermatitis. It's just mild. And I say, why don't we just start with gentle moisturizer and here's a gentle cleanser you can try. And, you know, and I see them back the next year. How, how has your eczema been? It's been great. I've been using that nice cream you gave me, that moisturizer. It's lovely. Perfect. No medicines. I'm happy as a clam. But that's not enough for most people, right? So we got to go to that next level. A lot of patients try that. And oh no, video's frozen. Uh oh. See, I can't see my video. I'm so sorry, you guys. Let me see if I can fix it. But audio is still working. That's good. All right. Sorry. Let me see if I can just fix this. Every program is a little bit different, you know? They, all right, let's stop it and restart it. Did that, let's see. Looking good. Does that fix it? Okay, for whatever reason, um, I can't see myself, but that's fine, so long as everything looks good. All right. Yeah, your mouth is yeah. moving now. <laughs> okay, cool. Hopefully I wasn't frozen in like a weird position, you know, like, <laughs> um, but all right, good. All right, so we, um, if that is enough, then we're super happy. If that is not enough, then we usually will do a reactive treatment. We'll treat when people are flaring up and then pull back. And there's a number of things we can do for that from topical steroids to non-steroidal agents, but we use it for a little and stop. When you look at, again, all the people in the world with eczema, this probably treats so many of them, right? That's And that's why a lot of doctors and practitioners are kind of like dismissive. They're like, oh, just like put a little steroid on it, you'll be fine. Because a lot of the patients are pretty straightforward like that. But again, you're not that patient if you're here tonight, almost for sure, because those patients just go about their business like, oh yeah, I used a little cream once or twice and I was fine. The problem is it kind of poisons the well because then for more severe patients, everyone's like, oh, just keep doing the same thing. But it's like, eh, it doesn't always apply. So that's why we have that next step where now we need to start thinking out of the box. These are the patients who start getting into that ramping up pattern where they're getting more and more and more. So I'm interested in thinking outside of the box though. Uh, I'm interested in thinking about from a disease pathophysiology. What is driving the disease? We talked about that loop. I like to break it down in terms of five pillars or features, the skin barrier, the mind-body, inflammation, the microbiome, and itch. And I like to think about all those together. And we can take each one of these and we can look at some of the different types of treatments in the alternative, complementary, integrative world. And we can look for those treatments that have some evidence that they work, right? Because otherwise it's the wild, wild west. People say, oh, I just found this herb in my garden and should I put it on my skin? Or what if I do 25 jumping jacks upside down? Could that work? I, the only answer scientifically is maybe I don't know, right? I just, there's all sorts of things I don't know. So the only thing we can really do from a scientific perspective ultimately is we have to have some evidence for it. Otherwise, anything could be, right? Is it possible that there's a certain kind of mushroom in, in the jungle that could cure it? Yes. It would be weird to say there couldn't be, right? There's no, I can't think of a good reason why there couldn't be, but we just don't know it yet, right? So we need some evidence before, and that's hard. Some patients say, well, I, you know, my friend or my cousin or my naturopath said we could try this herb. Is there anything on it? And I'll, I'll look and I'll be like, you know, I don't find any evidence, at least in the, the literature that I'm looking at. So I don't know. You know, we have to have some reassurances of safety and it has to be practical sometimes. And I push back, you know, I, I'm very interested in this world of integrative medicine and I love it. I'm fascinated by it, but sometimes I'll push back a little bit because I'll have a patient come in and they're on like 25 supplements. And I'm like, like, I don't think this is good for you at this point. I don't think this is natural anymore. I know they're natural supplements, but you're on 25 pills a day and it's not viable financially. These are th some of the patients pay thousands of dollars per month. I'm like, this doesn't make sense either. So I don't think that's practical. Now, everyone's different. So your mileage may vary, but I'm trying to find a way to do stuff that fit those criteria. And I would argue that 25 supplements is not, you know, not reasonable for most patients. If it's worked for you, great. You know, that's awesome. 
Um, but I'm trying to build this multidisciplinary integrated toolbox, and I really am trying to teach it too. So we're trying to build build it, teach it. We actually just started a journal called the Journal of Integrative Dermatology, so we can share ideas and learn and push it. Because it turns out a lot of the things we're about to talk about, most mainstream journals say, nah, -uh, we don't want it. They don't like it. So we made our own journal that uh, will hopefully be able to publish some of these things and get the word out so we can learn more. Because if you don't have access to the evidence, you end up with this self-defeating situation where it's like, well, we need evidence, but no one will publish it. So we can't get the evidence. So how can we move forward? Paracelsus, that same guy, father of toxicology and balneology, he admonishes us to seek knock and find and i love that right so i really love the idea that we're going to seek we're going to knock and we're going to find new treatment so let's start with the barrier and the skin barrier turns out to be incredibly complex this is my favorite part of really of dermatology is thinking about the skin barrier itself and how it works because it's not just like a brick wall like an anatomic or, or a, a basic you know physical barrier but there's also this functional aspect the microbiome plays a role the chemical barrier is really important the skin has to be acidic it's called the acid mantle it has a ph of around 4.5 so it is a little acidic and if it goes more alkaline it damages it really quickly and staph bacteria loves that so we've got to keep it acidic. We also know the immune layer is playing a role. So all these pieces have to fit together and have to work in harmony. Otherwise, we're in big trouble. If any one of these goes down, it's like dominoes. The whole thing will fall apart. And of course, many of our patients have multiple defects going on with this. They have a problem with the microbiome, it's imbalanced, problem with the chemical layer, it's too alkaline, problem with the immune layer, that they have all this extra inflammation damaging the skin barrier as well. So really interesting to think about this and how we can work on this. Why do I care so much about barrier? Well, it turns out it's not just bad for the skin, that when this happens, this allows for bacteria and other pathogens and other allergens to actually get into the body. And we now think that one of the key ways that people become allergic to food is through their skin. This is huge. This was published, this is just in the last years that we're finally really understanding this. Because for so many years, people are always saying, well, what food is driving my eczema? I just gotta cut out the right food. Is it the gluten? Is it the dairy? Is it tomatoes? Are you sure it's not nightshades? Could it be something like that? Maybe, some patients for sure, right? But it seems like the other way around is really the bigger story for almost every patient because we think that if your skin barrier is weak and damaged, then allergens get into the skin in this abnormal way. And this is how at least some food allergies seem to happen. So the stakes are high. And that's one of the things I'll talk to. Sometimes my, my patients will say, I don't really wanna use any treatments. Like I just want it to run its course or just do my thing. And I'm like, I respect that, of course, but I'm worried because it's it's possible that the sort of the side effects of having bad eczema are actually more than just having bad eczema, that we can now become sensitized to foods and allergens in the environment in a very abnormal way. So I often feel like our first order of business is we've got to heal that skin barrier. It's like having a house with none of the, the doors and windows working correctly. You know, bad guys are going to keep coming in. And while you might say, well, can't we just move, you know, move to a different neighborhood or get rid of all the bad guys? It's like, I don't think you can. You know, at some there's some degree of opportunistic crime that's going to happen. We just got to work on your windows and doors and get them better. And this has been shown a number of years ago, back in 2009, in the animal model. That's really amazing. They took these healthy mice and they shaved their back and then they used tape stripping. It doesn't hurt them. They just take a little piece of, it literally is like scotch tape and they just kind of peel um, over and over on the skin. It just as if you were doing it with a sticker on your own skin, it just irritates it a little bit and helps kind of break the barrier down a little bit. And then they put some ovalbumin, the egg protein on the skin and put it on there. They did this a few times. And then they found that these mice that were normally able to eat eggs, when they tried the eggs again, they were allergic to them. So they made the mice allergic to eggs through their skin. This is the idea. And we think this does happen in people. And this is why we're so passionate about getting that skin better, no matter what, right? Just letting it roll can be trouble. Well, what kinds of things damage the barrier in atopic dermatitis or in the world in general? It turns out tons of things. Modern life is incredibly damaging to our skin and our gut. Because remember, if you track your skin, right? Follow your skin, 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 gut. As soon as you go around your lip, it's your gut lining. Gut goes all the way through. So it's part of the same epithelium, right? It's us versus the outside world. We're a tube when you think about it, right? We're not, we think about when you eat something, it's inside of you. It's really not, you're just surrounding it right? Kind of wild. Um, 
there are a number of things that cause trouble. Poly, polystyrene microplastic, ozone, cigarette smoke, and particulate matter. It turns out in the wake of the California wildfires, people are seeing, we're seeing a spike in atopic dermatitis, really crazy. Um, we also know that things like diesel exhaust particles, nanoparticles, detergents, they like stay in our clothing. They stay, you know, we're using, we wash everything. We're a very clean society. That might be part of it. And then from a gut standpoint, emulsifiers and foods, right? That damages our gut lining. And it turns out that the proof is in the pudding. If you moisturize, it really does help most people with their eczema. It really does. I mean, I'm not making it up. It's the truth. This is a beautiful study showing the more moisturizer people use, the less severe their eczema was. And it's quite significant. This is major change just using moisturizer, which is pretty awesome. Again, does that explain everybody? No, of course not, right? This is a population study, but it does explain why we tend to push so hard on moisturizers. Sometimes I drive my patients crazy. I'm always talking about moisturizers. And it's like, which one is the best then? Or which one should I use? And the answer is, we don't really know. There are a lot of different moisturizers. We wrote this paper a number of years ago, just kind of comparing them. But there are some natural ones that I think can be at least, again, integrated. I don't think we have to replace anything, but we can integrate them in. And one of the ones I love is sunflower oil. It turns out that sunflower oil it increases our natural production of ceramides, those healthy fats in the skin, but also by itself has some direct barrier repair properties and a little bonus. It's a little bit anti-inflammatory. There was a study, so remember we said we needed some evidence. There was a study of looking at patients who were using a steroid plus a regular moisturizer or a steroid plus a moisturizer with sunflower oil, and they found that the sunflower oil group actually did much better at day seven and day 21 in terms of the lichenification, the thickening of the skin due to, due to rubbing or scratching. So it really did seem to have a nice effect. Here's a nice natural product. And again, I love this study because it's very integrative. They they're using a topical steroid, you know, but this just showed that it actually helped more than the moisturizer alone, which I think is so cool. There was a neat study of 19 adult patients who used olive oil as a control on their skin and then sunflower on the other arm. And they found that the olive oil actually made things worse. It actually made their skin more leaky. It made it more red. So I was like, ooh. And when I saw this, I thought, well, maybe I have a lot of patients who just say, can I try it? olive oil on their skin. I'm like, no, how about eat it? Don't don't put it on your skin because I'm worried about what they found. It's only 19 adults, not that many. And probably it's fine for some people, but it's interesting that they found as a group that made things a little bit worse. The sunflower group helped. It helped the skin barrier, it improved the hydration, and it didn't cause any kind of redness. So I think this is really a neat finding. Now, coconut oil is another one of my favorites. We're going to talk about it in a different context in a minute. But here, this just came out this year, just in June. And they were showing that in patients who are using a lot of alcohol-based hand sanitizer, which, hello, all of us to some degree, right? Everyone's washing their hands, using hand sanitizer. People who put coconut oil on their hands at night did much better than the control group. What a cool thing, right? Just some virgin coconut oil, put it on your hands at night. It seems to really help. And they concluded, based on the findings, a regimen of overnight virgin coconut oil application on the hands is a natural prophylactic against the increased frequency of alcohol-based hand sanitizer usage is recommended. So cool. And that's in the mainstream literature. It's actually in the Journal of Cosmetic Dermatology in June. I loved it. Now, another thing that has been studied to help the skin barrier is a supplement called L-histidine. That's it's an amino acid, and it turns out that filaggrin and its precursor they're very rich in histidine amino acid, this kind of protein substrate. So what they found is that in patients when they gave them oral supplementation with L-histidine, they found that it decreased their eczema severity by 34% after four weeks compared to the placebo group. Really neat, and this is. Um, they said it's kind of similar to what you might expect with a mid-potency topical steroid in terms of the magnitude of the effect. Obviously, this is not a story. This is just a, it's a protein supplement, basically, or a protein precursor supplement. And you can get it as a little capsule form or like a powder form and seems fairly safe. You know, I mean, I, I, we don't know all the safety on it, but it's pretty safe. It's, it's essentially these amino acids. So um, this is something that, that could be considered in certain situations. Now it's quite a bit. It was four grams per day, which is why when I talk about it with some of my patients, I'll usually have them get the powder and mix it into like a smoothie. Now, hemp seed oil is really interesting. Now, this is, again, oral, taking it by mouth rather than putting it on the skin, also has been shown to help atopic dermatitis. They, again, use olive oil as a control, again, but this time eating it, and they found that when the people 
eight to two tablespoons of hemp seed oil per day that decreased itchiness, dryness, use of their topical medicines compared to the olive oil group. And it's thought that this is because there are all these really healthy fats in the hemp oil that may help restore the skin barrier. So really cool. This is what it showed. Itchiness, dryness, use of medication all went down significantly. Very, very safe, very, very gentle, and kind of a neat thing to do. Let's look at our next area, which is the mind-body. And I just will point out one study that I thought was amazing. 20 kids with atopic dermatitis, ages 2 to 8, they got a nightly massage for 20 minutes, okay, versus a control group that just had their normal, regular care. What they found at one month, the parents of the kids who were getting the massage had lower anxiety levels in their children. They reported lower anxiety, but more importantly, or just as importantly, improvement in all the different measures, less red less scaly, less itch, less like kenification, the thickening than the control group. So what a cool thing. And what I often talk to my families about is trying a nightly massage with coconut oil or sunflower seed oil, or we actually even have a combo in our office of both because in the Midwest, uh, coconut oil congeals, you know, in the around 70 ish degrees. So for us, it's always a solid. If you're in the South or someplace warm and balmy, then you're thinking of it more as a liquid. But for us, it's always cold here. So it is um, often a, a solid. But when we mix it with a carrier oil like a hoba and then the sunflower oil, it actually stays liquid. So that's the one we have for our patients, which is really kind of cool. Let's talk about inflammation. This is a huge area. And one of the hardest things right now is that. Steroids do a good job for a lot of people, but they are not for everybody. And sometimes they've caused real measurable harm. Sometimes they're about to, right? I inherit a lot of patients who maybe haven't been harmed yet, but they're overusing. And I'm like, okay, we got to get you off these steroids. But some patients just don't want to mess with them. They're just like, I have uh, concerns about steroids. So this is a huge, huge issue. And we have to be willing to deal with this. We can't just, and I talk to my colleagues about it all the time. I'll be like, we can't just storm out of the room and say, that's, that's silly. Just use it. Like it's not, that's not being a good clinician. Like there are reasons why people can't. And of course, that's not the only thing people are concerned about. The black box warning on like the calcineurin inhibitors, overusing antibiotics, preservatives in general. There are so many things. So part of my drive for finding alternative approaches is that we can meet those needs. And also, I mean, those are real concerns that are legitimate. They're not crazy concerns. They're legitimate. So we're trying to find some alternative approaches. One of the ones that was most interesting to me is topical vitamin B12. So it turns out oral B12 does not seem to help with atopic derm. Probably wouldn't hurt anything, but it did not seem to help. But putting it topically on the skin is thought to help prevent flare-ups, which is kind of neat. There were a couple of really well-run trials on this showing significance. So well-run. One of them uh, was actually in the British Journal of Dermatology. So sometimes when I tell my colleagues, they're like, oh, this isn't that, this is not even that um, alternative or weird. Like it's in a mainstream journal. And once I learned about this, I thought, well, I want to try it for my patients, but how do I get it? Back then, I couldn't get it. Nobody seemed to be making it. So what I did was I had it made for my patients, and we call it Pink Magic and makes this beautiful pink color. There's no food coloring in there. Literally, the, the B12 powder, the methylcobalamin, is like crimson red. So when you mix it with like a moisturizer base, in this case, we have like a shea butter type base, it looks pink. It's beautiful. So we use this a lot. It's a very modest effect. I don't think it's a dramatic effect, but it is modest, but it does seem to help some people. And it seems very, very safe. That's what I like about it too. So especially in littler babies, I'll often use this. More recently, we've learned about topical indigo. And this is a blue powder from indigo plants, the indigo naturalis. It's been used in a lot of traditions for healing. It has some anti-inflammatory and bear repair, barrier repair properties. This is a study showing the improvement in patients using this kind of a, a version of indigo naturalis ointment compared to the vehicle, the control, and they found significant improvement. Look at this. Each week, they got better and better and better improvement for these patients. And again, same thing. There's no, to my knowledge, no commercial product out there that I could get. So we had it made for our patients and it's beautiful blue uh, color. So I use this a fair amount too, both for psoriasis and atopic dermatitis. Again, modest. I don't think this is as strong as a steroid. I wish, I wish I could replace everything, but it, it maybe can't for many patients, but it can be a helper. And for some patients, it can be what they're using in their maintenance phase. Maybe they still need to use a stronger prescription medicine for a little, but then they can take a break and use something like this. So that's the kind of little, little life hacks I'm looking for to get people better and keep them safe. 
just in the last couple of years, this paper came out, 2019, that showed black tea compresses dramatically improve facial eczema. And all you do for this is they had them, oh, I'll show you the recipe in a second, but you can see the improvement here over day three and day six. And then they actually did a beautiful scientific analysis of the data, the easy score of the face, that eczema area, severity index, itch went down dramatically, all these different measures. I mean, they studied it like a medicine, it's fantastic. And here's basically what they did. You get some tea, black tea, unflavored, you don't want anything that has any, any additives in there. You brew it up, you could drink that one or discard it. You brew up the second steeping. So that weaker second steeping is the one you want. And I usually tell my patients, put it in the fridge, get it nice and cool. And then you could just take a washcloth or soft gauze, gentle, you're not rubbing or scratching. You just gentle compress to those areas a few times a day, 15 or 20 minutes. And then you do want to moisturize right after because it's a little bit astringent and drying. But of course, black tea has a lot of great things. Antioxidants, it has tannins, which are both astringent and acidic. Remember we said that acid mantle. So there are a lot of reasons why this may help. And I've had very, very good response in many patients using it. It's very gentle. Speaking of tea, drinking tea also seems to help. 121 patients with atopic dermatitis that was recalcitrant. It wasn't doing well at all. They had them just drink oolong tea after each meal. Just a cup of oolong tea, three a day. And they found that at one month, 63% of them showed marked to moderate improvement. They saw improvement in one to two weeks. And even six months in, over half the patients still had a treatment response. What a neat little thing. Just drink a cup of oolong tea with breakfast, lunch, and dinner. It's so gentle. Could it be iced? Sure, why not? They did, they were, I think these were hot tea, but you could even ice it in the summer. It's great. Now, vitamin D has been a very interesting story as well, taking extra vitamin D. Rob Sidbury, my, my dear friend who's in Seattle, he did this study back in 2008, and it caused quite a ruckus. Everyone got excited. Uh, this was published in the British Journal of Dermatology. Very exciting. Showed that kids with eczema that worsens in the winter, when they get vitamin D supplement, they do better. And then there's been some back and forth about it, but there really is a general consensus that high vitamin D levels seem to correlate with less severe eczema and vice versa, low D, more severe eczema. And when we look at a whole bunch of the studies kind of plotted out against each other, it does seem like in general, there is a small but measurable effect to adding vitamin D. So almost all my patients, I do recommend extra vitamin D. Uh, they, they concluded, quote, this meta-analysis showed that serum vitamin D level was lower in the atopic dermatitis patients and vitamin D supplementation could be a new therapeutic option for atopic dermatitis. I think it is. I do think it's a helpful thing. Is it going to replace something? Not necessarily, but again, sometimes the difference between doing okay or barely getting by and doing pretty good, sometimes it's not that much of a difference. So if I can do a couple of little things, right, maybe that patient doesn't need to go on a stronger medicine. Maybe they don't need to use the steroid for a couple more days. That's great. That's a win. I'll take it. Let's talk about the microbiome, a very complex area. So many new things we're learning, so complicated. But the big breakthrough came with this idea that staph bacteria does seem to drive atopic dermatitis. It really pushes it. And we think it's because it's making a bunch of toxins. It makes toxins that not only damage the skin barrier, but also drive the immune system crazy. So when I learned about it 15 years ago, it was like, oh, the staph is just kind of hanging out on the skin. It's just a bystander. But I don't think it is anymore. I don't think, I don't think that was correct. I think we understand that staph is a driver of the disease on the skin, but also the microbiome in the gut is playing a role. And this is really fascinating. It turns out that the gut leakiness, okay, so how much, how much stuff can permeate through your gut correlates with more severe atopic dermatitis. So you want your gut to actually be strong barrier, just like our skin, right? Same epithelial concept. But if your gut is leaky, then not only do bad things get in the body, of course, you also have some absorptive problems too, because then your absorption starts falling apart. So pathogens can get in, but also we don't absorb well. So we really want to keep the gut healthy as well. And of course, it turns out that there are tons of things that can trigger changes in the gut. Uh, and that includes things like stress, circadian disruption, hello, sleep problems, anybody, right? Sleep deprivation, environmental extremes, toxins, pollutants, noise. We live in these noisy environments. I'm actually somebody who's really sensitive to a lot of noise. And I remember when I was in medical school, my window was right above a bus stop. 
And in the mornings, this big bus would sit and idle in front of my window. It was so loud and it would actually shake the room and, you know, just that go, 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 go. And I would like, I have like PTSD from it. It really stressed me out so much. And it went on for the whole year. And then I was like, I need to move to an inner room. I can't do this anymore. Physical activity and diet can help us in both, you know, either a positive or negative way. Of course, these are things that can influence it. So they did the study where they looked at the gut leakiness with patients with eczema. They were much leakier gut. They actually can look at these two sugars. They give you two sugars. They can see the big sugar shouldn't get into your bloodstream unless your gut is leaky. And they found, oh boy, these guys had a lot of leaky gut. But interestingly, not only did the gut leakiness correlate with the disease severity, when they gave them uh, probiotics, it got better. Not perfect, but it trended towards better. So that's one of our interesting things. And the reason it's so bad to have leaky gut or leaky skin is because, again, not just for the, the close aspect of it, the local aspect, but it actually affects everything. It affects the other systems, including the brain and the, and the, um, the joints as well. We can see arthritis and other things that are connected to having inflammation and problems with this. So again, for patients who tell me, I don't want to treat, I'm like, I'm worried, like this is a really bad state to be in. So yes, the treatments are scary. And yes, they have side effects, but so does this. So does unmitigated inflammation in the body and barrier damage. So we really need to do stuff. And also that's why sometimes you might know I'll get upset if someone says, oh, I talked to my alternative practitioner and they said it might take a few years to get this under control, which I respect for sure in the long term. but sometimes they're just absolutely miserable and on fire. And I'm like, so what are we gonna do right now? Because I don't know if being under super, super bad inflammation for years is advisable. Do you know what I mean? Like that is that is a problem in and of itself. And if they're wrong, and if you know we wait patiently for three years and it's still not better, now what? We've lost three years. And I again, I'm biased because I inherit those patients and I see them every single day where they've been told just wait a little longer, do the diet a little stricter for a little longer. You might have cheated that one time, and then you know a month becomes six months, becomes six years, and it's like oh my goodness. And they're like, well, you know, it's not working for me anymore. So. Obviously, I'm biased because those are the patients I get. If I were on the other side, maybe I would, you know, view it differently. I'd be, oh, I have patients who do great, and they, you know, I do these little interventions and they're fine. But I'm always seeing a bit of a broader picture because also I take insurance. I tend to be the last stop on a lot of people's lists, right? So sometimes I think there's a bias for cash-only practices, where if people are doing great, yes, they'll stay. If they're not doing great, they kind of, they, there's attrition. They're like, bye, it's not helping me. Um, and then they don't see that. So you'll often hear very confident clinicians say, all my patients get better. And I'm always very skeptical of that. You know, I'll say, I, I, I don't think that you mean it the way we mean it. Yes, all the patients who stay with you and continue to pay, yeah, I'm probably better in some degree. But, um, but I, I see some of the patients that don't get better. And definitely not all my patients get better. I mean, we really try really hard, but there's no doubt this is a super difficult condition, right? And then what we're learning about the, the microbiome has been fantastic. There's so many new things from probiotics and prebiotics, which are the foods, like the little actual oligosaccharides that actually help the good bacteria grow to postbiotics, which is their products of the good bacteria. And then we understand antibiotics and antiseptics. And now there are even concepts of things called symbiotics, where we take the good bacteria and the food that supports them and give it to people. And there's so much work going on. Everything we do affects our microbiome, including the moisturizers we pick. It's incredible. We can actually change the skin just from moisturization. Incredible. And then some of the natural products come in like coconut oil, which turns out to actually kill staph bacteria very, very nicely. Now, let me be clear. I would not use this for someone with a staph infection. It's probably not that strong, but they did a study looking at the colonization. Patients that grow staph on their skin, when they had them use coconut oil twice a day, they cut it down by 95% compared to only 50% in the control group. So it really does have some antibacterial effect. I love it, and I think it's very helpful. But again, I would never, like if somebody had a real skin infection, this would be, it would be malpractice because it's not enough. But for helping as an adjunct, as an integrative approach, absolutely, we can bring this on board. And I do think it can help some people. Now, it turns out it's also not a bad moisturizer. This was a study comparing it to uh, mineral oil in 117 kids with atopic dermatitis, and actually they did much better on the, the coconut oil group than mineral oil. I don't think mineral oil is the best um, moisturizer either, but kind of cool that it actually did so well. 
let's move to our final little spot, which is about itch. And itch is so fascinating because that's the thing that drives people crazy. We have so many unmet needs there. I wish I had better tools. One of the most exciting areas has been CBD. Uh, in general, the cannabinoids as a group, they have anti-itch, anti-inflammatory, and even wound healing properties, which is really exciting. Ones we're talking about, they're not marijuana. They don't have any psychoactive component. So they're made just with those key ones. The, the most commonly studied one are the, are the cannabinoids themselves um, in, in CBD, as opposed to the things like THC, which is the, the molecule that makes people have psycho, you know, psychological effect, the high of marijuana. But there are other ones. There's CBD, there's CBG, there's, there's all these different ones. And they affect so many parts of the skin from the fat cells to the hair cells to the inflama inflammatory system and the nerve endings really interesting. So stay tuned to that. There's a lot of work going on and I do think there's something there. Acupuncture is something that I studied formally. I spent a full year studying acupuncture, acupuncture under Kiko Matsumoto and David Euler in Boston. It was an incredible year. And then I spent an additional year as kind of an apprentice, which was awesome. And one of the things that I loved was this paper that showed 40 patients with refractory itch due to kidney failure, uremic paritis. It's the worst. They Nothing got them better. They failed everything. When they had them do acupuncture, they got significant relief. So then I said, wait, why can't we use this for atopic dermatitis? Why don't we try it? And we had people do acupressure, just put a little pressure instead of the needle. And we did this just as a pilot study, 15 adults, half of them used this little pressure three times a week. At that point, it's called large intestine 11 on kind of the crook of the arm. And what we found was it significantly helped. And what's so cool is I have a lot of patients who still say, hey, doc, I still do it. I still press on my spot whenever I'm feeling itchy really, really neat and very safe and free. It costs you nothing to use your fingertip to press, right? So how do we bring everything together, right? There's so much stuff going on in the domain of atopic dermatitis. So I try to pull from each one of these things, help the skin barrier, strengthen it, support it, help the mind-body connection, get people in a good state of mind, relax, sleeping well, taking care of themselves. That really affects the disease. It really does, like practically, measurably cool inflammation down. Yes, sometimes we need prescription things, but we can also use some of the natural things to help us strengthen and tonify the microbiome, rebalance it. And again, sometimes the natural products are way better. I don't want to drop a neutron bomb with you know, antibiotics, but maybe we can use things like coconut oil and some of the different ways to approach this. And then finally, itch. How can we help with itch using some of our complementary approaches to really help? In the meantime, there has been this incredible amount of work in developing new drugs for atopic dermatitis. So this is super exciting. Everything from new biologic agents to new small molecule pills to all these new topical agents. And there is a great place to stay tuned and learn more about them. That's the National Eczema Association. Of course, stay tuned right here for lots more information on these things. In conclusion, modern medicine really has the best treatments a lot of times, but it's because it's open to taking things from everywhere, right? Like the big idea is anything that works, even if we don't fully understand it, we'll say, let's use it, right? We want. I always say to my patients, I am not interested in being right. I'm interested in getting you better. So I'm more than happy to be proven wrong or to have a blow to my ego if you're better. I'm not in it for me. That's not that's not what's fun for me. What's fun for me is getting people better, is solving their problems and getting their life back. Then I'm happy. So I'm willing to learn. I'm willing to do whatever it takes. And I'm quite happy to admit we do not have all the answers. I spend all day wishing I had more answers. But by opening up to some of these things, sometimes we find new answers, new solutions, or little hints go, ooh, this really did agree well with you. Something about this. What if we go down that pathway? And in so doing, I think we also strengthen that therapeutic alliance. Thank you so much for your attention. And now we have a few minutes for questions. Uh, I will stop sharing and we can talk about anything you guys want to talk about. I hope you like that. All right, we have some great questions for you. And if anybody in our audience here wants to chat their question uh, or put their question into the question box, you are welcome to do so. Um, and we will try to get to as many as we can. So uh, question one, is there one element in this cycle of inflammation, microbiome, scratching, and immune response that is most commonly linked to worsening eczema? I would say the most common one would really be the microbiome. That's the one that, that they've been able to show most clearly that can trigger a flare up. But I honestly think any of them can do it. I truly believe it's, it is a very equal opportunity, vicious cycle. 
Equal opportunity vicious cycle sounds lovely. <laughs> uh, and you mentioned that emulsifiers in foods can affect eczema. What are some examples of emulsifiers? Yeah, a lot of processed foods have these emulsifier ingredients. And it literally will often say that word. It will say emulsifiers on the label. So processed foods, and that's the the, the idea of emulsifier is to basically mix oil and water together. Uh, and you'll see this in highly processed foods for the you know flavor and the the texture of them, but then that has to go through our gut. So my general approach to diet stuff is eating as healthy as we can. Uh, my favorite kind of diet to use that I lean on is called the AIP. It's called the autoimmune protocol diet. I like it because it's, you know, there's no, there's no, you don't have to buy anything. There's nothing proprietary. It's just basically eating natural unprocessed foods and really, I think, trying to eat more of a plant-based holistic diet like that. And I think you will automatically avoid emulsifiers. But yeah, keep take a look. Look at processed stuff. You'll see it all over. All right. And do you recommend a certain kind of sunflower oil? Not necessarily. Yeah. The studies just use like food grade. So yeah, you can go just to the grocery store and get just cooking grade, good food grade sunflower oil. That'd be perfect. Hmm. Cool. Do you recommend eating more healthy fats? Do you have any tips on how to do this? Definitely. The American diet is imbalanced with the omega-3 and omega-6 ratio. We get a lot of fat. We get a lot of everything. Americans eat in general a lot, right? We get a lot of stuff, but the, the ratios are a bit off. So yeah, so hemp oil is a great thing to do because the hemp oil is the right ratio. Um, actually, it's the other direction. So it helps balance out a Western diet a little bit. Fish is the right ratio. So fish is a really good thing to eat. Now, the problem for me with fish is that it has a lot of other stuff in it sometimes, right? It can have mercury, other toxins, metals, like in some people are allergic. Actually, a lot of people are allergic to fish. So it's not my favorite way anymore, but I think in old times, you know, eating a lot of fish, it can be protective. Now, certain fish oil supplements can be purified in a nice way, and that's a nice way to do it too if you don't want to actually eat the fish. Um, some of the brands are independently tested to make sure they're mercury-free and so on. So that's another way to do it. Um, uh, the other things that I think can be good, hemp seed, Seeds have that same oil in there. So I know at Costco, they have a giant bag of hemp seeds, which I love on salad and stuff. They're kind of nutty and delicious. That's a much even more holistic way than getting the hemp oil. Thank you for that. Uh, I have heard that collagen protein is supposed to help strengthen your hair and skin. Is this true? And if so, why? I'm glad How you asked that. That's a funny question. Yeah. So for a long time, I really thought that taking oral collagen was dumb. I'm like, it doesn't make any sense. It's a big molecule. It probably doesn't get through our gut. It's just, it's just protein. You could just eat a steak or just have a protein shake, whatever. But I wrote, I had to write an editorial looking at this data. They wrote this meta-analysis. It really does seem like taking oral protein uh, supplement actually really helps. It's really crazy. And I don't fully understand why there's, there's a little hand waving, but I think you do absorb it. it. turns out in our gut, we actually have transporters that are specifically designed for some large molecules. And apparently collagen is one of them. We can pull it in. So some of these collagen supplement mixes really do seem to help with, yeah, skin. And most of the studies that, that have looked at it are for aging effects. They seem to help like the elasticity of the skin and the strength of the skin. To my knowledge, they haven't really looked at it in atopic dermatitis, but if the barrier is stronger and the skin is more elastic, it is possible, maybe even probable that it would help. So, so long as you're not spending an arm and a leg on it, I think that it is probably something that could help and is definitely not as crazy as I used to think it was. I really had to change my mind on the subject when I wrote that article. That's really neat to hear. Those large molecules can get through. Uh, a question uh, pertaining to sunflower seeds, back to sunflower. Allergy to sunflower seeds, am I allergic to topical sunflower oil? Uh, yes. So, you know, with first of all, I'll, I'll even be more broad. People can get allergic to just about anything, including Vaseline. So I've had some, you know, uh, colleagues who'd be like, well, you can't be allergic to Vaseline or petroleum. I'm like, actually, you can. <laughs> like, there's actually a literature. So you can be allergic to pretty much everything. Botanicals, so plant-based things, are very, very common allergens. So for example, tea tree oil, which I actually do use for acne and can help, is one of the common allergens, unfortunately. It's, it's a good one. It's sensitizing. Nuts in general, as we know, peanuts, tree nuts, those are also really common allergens. So some things seem to be much more shrimp. You know, lots of people have a shrimp allergy. They're more allergenic. 
than other things. Sunflower oil is, in my experience, much, much less likely to be allergenic than others, but not zero. In fact, my own daughter is allergic to sunflower. I never, I never put sunflower oil on her, but she is allergic to sunflower butter. So crazy, rare. Um, she has a bunch of nut allergies. So it can happen. Same with coconut. It is a fairly rare allergen, but it can. So if you weren't sure, and if you were allergic to the seeds, I would not use the oil. Yeah, I definitely wouldn't. But if you weren't sure, or you thought maybe you were allergic, I don't think it'd be crazy to try a tiny little area. So long as you didn't, you know, if you didn't have known anaphylaxis reaction, I wouldn't even toy with it. But if you're not sure, thought maybe I was irritated or I felt a little upset stomach or something once when I ate it, I think it would be okay to try a small area on a, on a spot in your body and see what happens. Um, if it didn't bother you, it's very likely that you'd be okay. The problem is sometimes between different brands, some brands are maybe really filtered. There's no protein in there, right? So in theory, even if you were allergic to sunflower, the seed, if they purified the oil enough, you could potentially use it with no problem because there's no protein. We know this because peanut allergy, right, is really serious, life-threatening for a lot of people, but there is a topical steroid, some of you probably have had it all prescribed to you, where they put it in a peanut oil base. But the peanut oil base is so purified that they actually studied it in truly peanut allergic people, and it's fine. There's no protein. They, they cleaned out. But with botanicals like this, you don't know. That's the problem. So I've had people say, I've never had trouble with sunflower or, uh, or co coconut oil, but then I got one brand and that one triggered me. And I think maybe that one had extra protein in there. So that's why it's a little tricky. So if you're not sure, when in doubt, hold off. But if you, if you don't suspect it, it is always good to try a small area first. Thank you for that. And here's a question that I can answer. Uh, are we going to have access to the recording of this webinar? Yes, the registrants will be emailed a recording of the webinar within a few days. And so on to our questions for Dr. Leo here. Uh, what about shea butter? Any studies on that? Shea butter is really neat. It's a very, very nice, um, it's a very nice moisturizer in general. Uh, many people like it, especially during pregnancy. It, there's a small literature that it may help with stretch marks. To my knowledge, nothing specific about atopic dermatitis, but again, a good moisturizer. So totally reasonable to experiment with it in a rare allergen, even though it's kind of a distant cousin of nut. So some people again can react to it, but it's rare. Got it. And what does astringent mean? You mentioned it as an effect for several treatments. Yes. Um, so astringents are kind of, they're, they're, they will dry things out and make the skin feel tight or taut. So tannic, like tannic acid in tea, you know, when you drink a cup of tea, your mouth feels kind of, that's the astringent effect. On the skin, it can be really helpful for oozy, open, weepy stuff. That's when we want to use it. If the skin's really dry, then it might not be so good for it. And that's why you want to moisturize over it um, to kind of replete some of the water. But I, I had a patient the other day, she had a big infected area of eczema, all weeping, and it was gross. We did the black tea compresses, and within just a couple of days, it was like beautiful. Everything was healing nicely. So it was so cool to see that. And she loved it because... A lot of things have stung and burned her skin, and this was really gentle. Obviously, you know, nice and cool, keep it in the in the fridge. And that second steeping, the 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 less, the more dilute, the less concentrated one. So, uh, how much vitamin D is typically recommended? Yeah, there's a lot of discussion about this um, in general, but I think. You know, you can you can always get your blood work done to get a sense, and your doctor can help pick that out. But a general guidance that I, I give to my patients is for babies, I usually give them 400 IU, so they come at the international unit IU, 400 IUs per day. Most babies, that's what's in a lot of the baby drops, so that's easy. The older kids, I'll usually either give them two of those baby drops, or they make a thousand IUs drops, so I'll give like my my older kids and adolescents that. And then for adults, 2,000 IUs is a really good number. You could probably comfortably go up to 4,000, which is what I give my more severe eczema patients. Um, and I myself take 5,000 a day. Now, can you get toxic on it? You actually can, yeah, because it's a fat-soluble vitamin. You can overdo it. But uh, for most of us, 
uh, probably it's not going to happen. But I, I've had a couple of patients over the years. I think there's something funny about their vitamin D production where they've taken a supplement and they've gotten toxic on it. They had a real high level. Usually they're not sick, but like the blood level went crazy. So it is recommended if you're supplementing. I think checking it once a year is not a bad idea at all just to make sure. And usually once a year, insurance companies will pay for it. I know that for a while I was trying to do it a little more frequently. And then patients called me and they were upset. They're like, they didn't cover the last one. And it's a couple hundred bucks to test it. So usually in an annual physical, they can check it. If you're real high or on the high side, they might say, cut it down a little bit. If you're still low, like me, I mine was like 17 and you should be at least like in the thirties or forties. So I take 5,000. And when I checked again, I mean, I'm still like barely in the middle. So my body needs a lot more. Interesting. Uh, and we have a few more minutes, maybe two or three more minutes for questions here. And I have a couple left. So let's see how many we can get to. Um, for people with eczema, is there a risk of acupuncture breaking the skin and causing problems with staph? Thank you. Yes, um, there is. And that's also why uh, when I wrote our paper, when we did our study, we used acupressure. That's exactly why we did it, because the Institutional Review Board, the Safety Board said, eh, we're worried we're worried about that. We don't want you to you know, get an infection. So yes, in theory, it could happen. Now, practically speaking, it's pretty rare because the needles for most acupuncture are, are tiny. They're really tiny. But if they did it in an area that was infected, yeah, you probably could get a small infection. Just about time for, for a couple more here, maybe another minute. What is the name of the histamine product? Didn't catch that. Oh, it was called L-histidine. So not to be confused with histamine, right? Like antihistamines, but histidine with a D. And um, if you go on Amazon, punch in L-histidine supplements, you'll find a whole bunch. And like I say, you can take it either as a powder or you can take it as a, a pill. Um, you know, we don't know that much about it, so I'm not exactly sure. And I don't really have a brand that I know and trust yet, but I have recommended it to some people. And, you know, I kind of go on Amazon and I look at some ones that are highly rated. You want to try to just get one that has um, independent lab verification of it too, just to make sure. Great, thanks. And is there research on topical probiotics on newborns to prevent the development of AD? Oh my gosh, yeah, there's so much discussion about this right now. It's so exciting. So um, the, the prevention, if you check, I think it was in Eczema Matters, I think you can find an article we wrote on called The State of Prevention. We kind of covered a whole bunch of the new things that people are doing to try to prevent it. Everything from topical, oral uh, probiotics to different types of dietary changes, all these different things. So have a look. But yes, so far it has been um, oral probiotics have been studied the most in newborns, but there are a couple of trials right now looking at topicals to help. And oral probiotics, in particular lactobacillus strains in newborns, seem to help prevent it. Actually, it's there's some evidence that it suggests that it actually may. So uh, stay tuned to this area. We're trying to figure out what if we could prevent the darn thing. Wouldn't that be amazing? It would be. And we have one more question for you. Dr. Leo, how much water is needed to keep skin hydrated daily? How much water daily? My my good friend and colleague, Dr. Vivian Shi, wrote a paper about this. Her last name is SHI. And it was really fascinating. It, it turns out that maybe less than you think. Um, they looked at a number of different scenarios, including like marathoners who like are super, super, super fluid depleted. Like they're at the end of the marathon, they're very dehydrated. It turns out that their skin is still actually pretty strong. And it turns out you would need to be incredibly fluid deficient for a very long time to actually not have enough water in your skin. Your skin needs so little compared to the rest of your physiology. That being said, I say that only because sometimes my patients are like, well, maybe I need to just drink a lot more water. And I have patients come in with like two, two liter Nalgene bottles and they're on their fifth one. I don't think it'll necessarily hurt you, although you know you can overdo it with water, right? They call it potomania. People get sick, they wash out their kidney gradient and they can die. In fact, you know, it usually happens to beer drinkers. In Germany is the big place where this happens during Oktoberfest. These guys sit and drink liter after liter after liter of beer and they, they get sick, they start having seizures. So you don't wanna drink that much water. But staying hydrated and enough that your urine is clear is a great internal way to make sure that you're getting enough fluids. Obviously, if you're thirsty, you should drink. But I do think there is a little bit of a weird cult around, you know, drink more water, drink more water. And in, in, in my own family, people are always like, drink more water. But uh, so long as your, your urine's going clear and you're, and you're getting enough, your skin probably will be okay. And Vivian wrote this paper to kind of debunk it that it's just drinking more water will help. It probably won't hurt up until that point. But don't be surprised if you say, boy, I've tripled my water intake and my skin still feels pretty dry.
Cheers for that answer. And with that, we have completed our Q&A. Dr. Leo, thank you so much for the presentation and for answering our questions about complementary and alternative treatments for eczema. And many thanks to you all for joining us today. You can continue your eczema education on our website at nationaleczema.org. You may register for one of our upcoming webinars or our meetups, or sorry, not our meetups, just one of our upcoming webinars, or watch a recording of a previous webinar at nationaleczema.org slash webinar dash Wednesdays. Once again, I'm Danny Morsehead on behalf of the National Eczema Association. Thank you for joining us.